Church, North Guilford Congregational Church, has been here since 1812. They could see battles going on, the War of 1812, down in the Sound. But there's something new here today, and that is our Reverend Judith Cook. Now, you've been the pastor at North Guilford Congregational Church, UCC, for nine months. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the church? Well, it is a family-friendly, open, welcoming, enthusiastic group of people. Um, I have enjoyed my time there very much. They are committed to missions, committed to uh, the Sunday school, very dedicated to their wonderful music program. So it's a, a congregation with many gifts, many talents. And um, how, how, does, how does this the denomination, the UCC, how is it different than other denominations? That's a big question. Yeah. The United Church of Christ has been around for 50 some years, but we have a very long heritage. We are the merger of four traditions. The Congregational Church merged with a group that called themselves the Christian Church, and the Evangelical Church merged with the Reformed Church, and then the Congregational Christians and ENRs merged 50 some years ago. Many of the churches in Connecticut that say that they're Congregationalists, like ours does, North mm -hmm. Guilford Congregational Church, is actually not part of the congregational denomination right now. We're part of their tradition, their heritage, mm -hmm. but there are some stubborn congregationalists who never did merge. The United Church of Christ is a socially active, uh, forward-thinking, dedicated, committed, wonderful denomination. The more people find out about them, the prouder I am of who we are and what we do. The way we are set up is very different than some churches. In the Catholic Church or the Episcopal Church, the power's at the top of the triangle, where mm -hmm. you have the Pope or the bishops, and the people are down below. We are the reverse of that. The, we're the upside-down triangle. At the top is the entire congregation mm -hmm. that has the ultimate decision-making power. So we tend to be uh, congregationalist. The congregation makes the ultimate choices. Mm -hmm. They are the ministers. I am the pastor. We all work together. And uh, the United Church of Christ is, uh, celebrates that part of our heritage as well as uh, forward thinking. Yeah. I, I've run into uh, UCC ministers, a, a, quite a range of theological opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them believe that Christ is divine, third person of the Trinity. Some do not. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion? What, when we think of Christ, Right now, we think of Christ as Lord and Savior, um, a specific Son of God entity. He was also originally the, the manifestation of God that came to earth, came as Jesus of Nazareth. And he did not come out of nothing. He came not into nothing. He wasn't Christ in a vacuum. He came to a very specific context. So at that time, his concerns were social, political, economic. He was very much a revolutionary. Uh, he came to turn the world upside down and overthrow some, some things. So if you take that part of who he was, we can find that Christ had some very subversive aspects to who he was. He was not in favor of the Roman government which was occupying the Holy Lands. Mm -hmm. He was not in favor of the temple priests who were making a profit mm -hmm. while they were serving. And he was certainly not in favor of the social economic situation, which had the haves, the have nots, and the disposable people. No middle class, but they had people who were obscenely wealthy, people who had nothing, were just barely scraping by the peasants, and then the people who were disposable. If they disappeared, no one would notice or care. They were the lepers, mm -hmm. the prostitutes, the homeless, the disease, the widows, the orphans. And Jesus came and said, everybody matters. Every one of you matters. As God's special sacred son, the Christ on earth, he came and said, all of you matter, no matter how least and lowly you feel. And that was very subversive and revolutionary at that time. So when we talk about him as Christ, those messages, I believe, still carry on today, that he was the best example of 
how God wants a human to live on this earth that we have, mm -hmm. a sacred, powerful figure. And it is true that in our denomination, every local church is autonomous. We have some things that our denomination supports, and yet every local church is able to make its own decision whether they agree with that or not. And pastors too. That uh, North Guilford Congregational asked me a lot of questions about what do I believe mm -hmm. and how would I lead the church as their pastor before they hired me to make sure that we have the same set of beliefs. Yeah, I think Christ transformed the world and the world today is because of him much different than it was 2,000 years ago. I know uh, I have a grandson that is uh, mm. severely handicapped and has a, has a serious illness. Mm. And yet people are wonderful to him. Mm. It, it is absolutely amazing. He's been on television. They, they yeah. do all sorts of things uh, for him. Uh, but I know that in ancient times, in Jesus' time, a child like him would have been left to die. Yes. Yes, he would have. Yeah. So I, I, I leave this question open to everyone. What transformed the world so that we now care about people like my grandson? And I can only think that it's what you said. It's Jesus. Mm. And yet we have such a long way still to go. There still are so many people that really are disposable in our own culture. And you go to see the homeless population, some of these homeless men on the park benches, or our youth group that just went up to Boston on that mission trip to feed the homeless and hungry. Many of those people, if they simply disappeared, how many others would notice or care? Society would still go on. It wouldn't make front page news. Yeah. We still have a long ways to go. And, and yet we have come. The transformation is a slow process, isn't it's it? It's an ongoing process. But ongoing Jesus said, you know, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. It is starting right now. It is here. It has begun. And we are in that, that process. We are part of ushering in the kingdom of God, part of doing Christ's work in the world. The church is the body of Christ on earth. And it's a very exciting thing that we get to do as God's people, as Christ's people. That's, that's, that's good. Now, uh, what are the worship services like to change the okay. subject into something more? Sure. Well, it uh, depends on which Sunday you come. Uh -huh. Most Sundays, we have our traditional worship service at 10 a.m. We have an amazing music program, thanks to Hallie, our choir director, director of music. Hallie, the director of music, mm -hmm. and our organist, David Irvine, and an amazing choir. So the music is wonderful, but it's a traditional service. We focus on scripture, sermon takes a top place. We have an amazing director of Christian Ed who does wonderful children's talks with the kids. And it is a traditional congregational United Church of Christ service. The first Sunday of every month is our family service. And that service tends to be a little less ordinary. Because children are part of that service, we work very hard to make it multi-sensory Communion is also that Sunday, so we will have different worship spaces. We've done some pretty elaborate things, thanks to Dawn, our wonderful Christian Ed person who is so creative. She has, we dragged in a tree once with apples on it for her to act out the scripture passage of pruning the trees and, and uh, harvesting the fruit. That same service when we were talking about plants, as we talked about the different healing properties of some plants that God has given us, she was repotting those very plants and then having church members take them to give to someone who needed those healing mm -hmm. properties in their life as a symbol of God's care for them. So some of the things that we've done, and puppets have been a big part of it too. I have a couple puppets that I'm very fond of, and we do some puppet ministry in those services as well. The strange thing about family services, I inherited family services. They were going on before I came. I listened to what the church wanted, talked to the deacons and Christian Ed and the parents, and we put together these services. And I wasn't sure that our older crowd or the grown-ups at all would tolerate them because they are so multifaceted, so multisensory. It turns out that my biggest fans of the puppet are my older crew. Mm -hmm. Some of the sweetest little old ladies rave about the puppets. The things that we do that are multi-sensory 
connect very well with our church members of all ages. I think the model of worship where you sit in the pew and listen and sing and pray, but listen to the scripture being read, listen to the sermon, listen to the anthem has, uh, I think it's wonderful. It's what I've grown up with. It's service that's very meaningful to me and meaningful to a lot of people. But at the same time, these multi-sensory ways of connecting with God in worship have worked for all ages much better than I dreamed of. And that's been very exciting, the, the positive response. And those services are growing in attendance and in enthusiasm. Tell me some about, you say puppets. Uh, what, what personalities do you have? Oh, let's see. I have one puppet named Lewis. He's the one that's mostly been featured so far yeah. at North Guilford. He is um, a church lover, loves all things about the church, is convinced that he knows everything better than everyone else and gets everything wrong. Okay. So he's kind of my bumbling do-gooder. My other puppet that I'm very fond of is Mimi. She's a red hair ponytailed puppet, although everyone thinks her ponytails are antenna, the way they stick out. Mm -hmm. And she is new to church, so everything in church is new to her. She's learning as she goes. And I have an old man puppet who needs some repairs before he can come out. <laughs> and he is the wisdom of the church, the wise older humorous and delightful church. Yeah, I don't think that's a character I don't think I've seen yet. No, he's in my office. My problem with him is um, he was in storage for a little while and his wrinkles came out. The older he got, the less wrinkled he got. <laughs> so I need to re-wrinkle him. He was one that I made. Lewis and Mimi were our professionally made puppets. My old man puppet is less professional. He's larger. He's a Muppet-sized puppet. The others are large hand puppets, but not true Muppet size. Yeah, something to look forward to. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. I love them. Uh, and you have included these elements in regular worship. That's what you just told us about. Well, what other actually, elements? Actually, yeah, actually we've done, um, we try to include some more multi-sensory aspects to worship throughout the more traditional services. I like worship to be something that people can come in, be comfortable with, know that they're not, I don't want them awkward and uncomfortable. I don't want them to think, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? I want them to know church is a place where people should come and be able to connect with God without stressing that something bizarre is going to happen. And yet, we want to breathe in some new life here and there. So even in the traditional services, we will occasionally have something that is out of the ordinary. Our stewardship program this year was four different Sundays that was, they were adult services with a traditional service, but their, their theme was, my cup runneth mm -hmm. over. And the first week they built a wading pond. A, well, a, what would you call it? It was a pool, a wading yep. pool, but they turned it into a pond, a wishing pond. We had yeah. a wishing pond. People were fishing in it, if I remember correctly. They were supposed to be making wishes oh, with pennies. We were yeah, throwing pennies in. A, uh, I thought they were pulling something out, too. But maybe no, that was the week with the dragonflies. Oh, and yeah, that was our right. near flub. That right. was when we nearly crashed one of the flying puppets. Okay. Yeah, that, so we had the, the wishing pool, and people came in and said, Oh, my gosh, you're not going to... I can't believe you did this. This is amazing. It looked so beautiful. The fake rocks that Dawn helped build, she's our yeah. creative genius. They were, it was unbelievable. It looked so good. The next week... Maybe it wasn't the next week. One of the following weeks, we added uh, running water. So we had overturned clay pots with fountain water coming through. So it was a trickling stream. When we did a water bugs and dragonfly puppet presentation talking about transformation and new life, that was when our dragonfly puppet nearly, when he was supposed to be flying over the water, he nearly got a bath. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. As my mom said with driving, a miss is as good as a mile. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't get in the water. So, yeah, th and then eventually we had, oh, what was the last week? I can't remember the last week. But we built it up mm -hmm. so that it grew from a pond into a waterfall. And it was such a striking visual that kept people very connected. Have we answered about how, how did you originally get, this, get these ideas to try this? What was the source of, of, oh, well, of, your, of the puppet ministry, of the idea of having these characters? Well, my, 
my, my theory on ministry is, you know, I, I grew up in the church. I have been in church since before I could walk every single Sunday. And, and church is very special to me. And I've noticed, with and we moved a lot too, so I've noticed that with different pastors, they have different styles. And it always irritated me when a new pastor came and expected the whole church to get on board with him or mm -hmm. her. And I've always thought it's much easier for one person to get on board with the church than the whole church to get on board with one person. And my other theory with ministry is go with the energy. If people are passionate about something or really want something mm -hmm. or feel very called by God to do something, go with it. Go with it and make it work. So several churches ago, there were a group of parents who said, you know, we saw this puppet ministry mm -hmm idea and what do you know about it? And I said, I got squat. I know nothing, mm -hmm. but let's figure it out together. So they were so enthusiastic. We did some research and learned about puppets. The reason I made my old man puppet is we were trying to do puppet ministry without putting any money out. And churches are notoriously on a tight budget and or tighter than bark on a tree. <laughs> so we were trying to make our own puppets and avoid the expense. It turns out it's much harder to make a puppet and they're not often as sturdy that children can use them. Yes. So that's why we ended up buying puppets, but we started puppet ministry because that's where the energy was. I see. And the same with worship. When people have said, we want worship that the children connect with, we've said, well, what, what do you think they would connect with? And worship is not entertainment. We do a lot of things that might look entertaining. That's not our goal at all. Our goal is to help people connect with God. And children do not connect with God very well sitting and listening to an adult sermon. Mm -hmm. So we have to find other ways to help them connect. If we want them to learn about the scripture passage, reading from the King James translation in a deadpan monotone is not going to help them connect with the scripture or connect with God. So we're trying to find ways that the children and all people will connect with God. That's our ultimate goal. So when people say, you know, I would do better if we had some time of silent prayer so we could listen for God speaking to us. So this is your approach to seeing and trying to get the church to flourish more, to get... Well, and I, I have this other theory, too, that the reason the churches are in decline right now, many churches are in decline, mm -hmm. many mainstream churches, is not because we're not needed. God knows this culture is so spiritually hungry yeah. with the many things that are being offered now from yoga to tai chi to holistic and um, wholeness healing approaches which are all good and wonderful and i believe in keeping with god, what god wants yet they are not enough to help people connect with god they are not doing it our culture is still spiritually hungry i think the church has a lot of the solution to that and yet we try to bore people as much as possible and wonder why they don't want to come back. Mm -hmm. We're not willing to change and try something new, do things differently. And then when the church started declining, they became very self-focused mm -hmm. and started saying, how do we get more people in our pews? How do we get more money in our budget? How do we keep the church alive? A just sort of defensive stand rather than and church, exploring new and church focused instead of God right. focused. Right. And as soon as you start saying you come to church for church, I think we're worshiping the church like it's a false idol. I think we come to church for God. Mm -hmm. We come to church to connect with God, to learn about Christ, to refuel, re-energize, and then go out and serve the best we can. It is a place of nurture and renewal. But then instead of worshiping the church as this false idol we can't change our programs we've done this this way forever yeah. we can't try women's ministry a new way because we've always done it this way we need to start thinking what does god want and how do we connect with god and that's really been a big part of what's helped church be so successful where i've gone most places when we connect with god listen for what god wants and take some risks in faith things go very well when we focus on ourselves, on getting enough money for the budget because we're too afraid that we don't have mm -hmm. enough funds, too worried that our congregations are aging and there aren't enough new families moving into the neighborhood, we don't do as well. But as soon as we start saying what we have here is sacred and special, part of God's plan for our lives and for this world, that it will transform not only us but those we come in contact with, 
the church flourishes. God's will does, God does well through us. And that's a really wonderful answer, by the way. Uh, it's I'm very passionate about it. I really believe that that's a big part of why the church is in decline yeah. and what we need to do. And it's scary. It is very scary to do things in a new way. And yet, I'm sure we are going to try some new things at North Guilford that are going to bomb. We're going to try some things that are going to, will just, will not work for people. And then we will say, wow, that didn't work. What are we trying next? And we will move on. Everybody has failures in a church. We haven't seen a lot yet, but I've only been here nine months. Mm -hmm. Mistakes are coming. Problems are coming. But mostly, you know, they're all manageable. They're all things that will be learning experiences. Flubs are not tragic if you handle them right. Right, right. I, I, yeah, particularly when you're moving forward. God knows if anyone makes mistakes in church, it's yeah. me. Yeah. I think you saw me fall off the step. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, mistakes happen. Things, awkwardness happens. If you can laugh about it and learn from it, nobody minds and no one remembers it as a mistake. Yeah. But we've certainly learned, we've learned a lot from our mistakes with the family worship services. The first family worship we did, we had engaging visuals, engaging multisensory, engaging everything. And then we came to the time of prayer and went into communion. And by then, the children were no longer able to sit still for communion. We had used up all of their good boy and girl behavior, got them a little excited, and then told them to sit quietly for 15 minutes. And we wondered why. We didn't really wonder hard. But some people said, well, they did great at the beginning, but then all of a sudden they couldn't handle it. Well, yeah, we set them up for that. Mm -hmm. So now we've rearranged things so that we have more multi-sensory clear through and we spread out the times where we expect them to be quiet and reverent and they're able to do it. They're much better able not just to not disturb people, but to understand what that prayer time is for and how they can pray. They're able to understand what communion is, is about as well as anybody can. Mm -hmm. I mean, communion is still one of these great sacred mysteries beyond adults' understanding. And yet the children do well. They understand this is a time when we connect with God and Christ powerfully and intimately. And if we space things out well, they do very well, and it's meaningful to them. So we've learned from our mistakes already. And I don't know that anybody has said to us that first service had problems, mm -hmm. other than those of us who looked at it afterwards and said, what worked and what didn't? What do we need to, to tweak? Okay, I think you've covered everything that I had to <laughs> ask. Is there anything that you feel we haven't covered that you would like, uh, like to hear our audience to hear? That's a good question. Um, our Sunday school program is exceptional, and I wish I could take credit for much of that, but I really can't. Dawn Longley, our Director of Christian Education, is very committed to helping the children grow in faith, and she understands that not all children learn from a traditional Sunday school setting. Mm -hmm. It used to be the model, children sit around the table, fill out the worksheet, talk to the teacher, answer questions, have cookie and juice, and then go meet their parents. And what we are finding is many children do not learn well in that setting. So she has a, ro a modified rotation model where she has a drama room. She has, we're working on establishing a computer room. We've got a little ways to go on that still. Mm -hmm. she has a, an arts and crafts room, worship spaces, different rooms for different kinds of Sunday school lessons. And then the children come in and they are, again, multi-sensory. They use their bodies. They learn in many different ways. And, and that's very exciting because gone are the days when children are willing to sit with a worksheet and fill in the blanks about the Bible passages. These are children who are good with technology, who could use it better than some of us, who are active, energetic. There are countless special needs children in every church who simply will not learn in the stereotypical traditional classroom. And our church is committed to being inclusive of all people, regardless of their ability level. Like your Sam came mm -hmm. to, he was, in, he was a wise man in the Christmas pageant in his wheelchair. And that was, was meaningful to us, I hope to him as well. I've never seen a happier wise man in my life. <laughs> He's so, so precious. But we want all children to know that they are valued at our church. That you don't have to look like 
like everyone else. And families are no longer a man, a woman, a boy and a girl. We have in our church uh, several families where the grandparents are bringing their grandchildren. And that's how the, how the children are coming. We want them to know some families have someone who's divorced and they're still welcome. We have uh, some people along the way who have dealt with addiction issues. They are welcome. Mm -hmm. We want people to know that our church is a place where they matter and can come to connect with God and be part of the faith community. So the Sunday school is one of the foundational places that they get that message across. The other thing our church is very committed to is uh, missions and social action. Our missions committee has a few pet projects that they are very dedicated to. They serve at Columbus House every single month. They put together this elaborate pork loin dinner with baked potatoes and vegetables and it, I have to say, it looks so much better than anything I ever cook. They do a, a beautiful job and every month get that meal down there. And they're also big with the angel tree every Christmas. They have a wide variety of children and adults in need that receive Christmas gifts through our church. But missions is not limited at all to our missions committee. Our deacons work very hard with different mission projects. Our youth and Sunday school do a lot of mission projects. They do things from uh, learning about and supporting Heifer International to work trips up in Boston to help feed the homeless. Our youth were up until one or two in the morning making sandwiches to serve the following day. And then they got up again, I think around 6 a.m. or a little before to finish their work. So these are some dedicated youth who worked their tail feathers off to help people that they knew were in need. And we try to reach out to people throughout our community, throughout our country, and throughout the world. So missions is something dear to our hearts that we work very hard at. And I wish Hallie was around to explain music. Um, I suspect you've gotten a couple of clips of them yes. singing and playing. So yeah. But the music program is exceptional. They do such a nice job. Is there anything else? I think those are the high points. Okay. Wonderful staff, wonderful people. Come and visit Judith and everyone else every Sunday at 10 a.m. Go straight up Long Hill Road till you get to the top of the hill. You can't miss us. White church with the tall steeple. I hope to see you there one Sunday. Have a good day.